Hi everyone, today I'm going to take you through the case study of IKEA. This case study describes IKEA's growth, including the importance of a sourcing strategy based on its close relationships with the suppliers in developing countries like India, Pakistan, and Nepal. This case study also describes how in response to regulatory and public pressures, IKEA developed a set of environmental policies that grew to encompass a relationship with Greenpeace and WWF on forest management and conservation. So before moving to this case study, I would request everyone watching this video to subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube in order to get more such case study video updates on time. Also, this video is enabled with English subtitles for your better understanding. Now let's move to the case study. To understand IKEA's operation, one had to understand the philosophy and beliefs of its founder, Ingwer Kamperer. Ingwer was just 17 years old when he started the mail order company, which he named as IKEA, the name that combined his initials with those of his family form. Working out of the family kitchen, he sold goods such as fountain pens, cigarette lighters, and binders, which he purchased from a low price sources and then advertised in a newsletter to local shopkeepers. When Campred matched his competitors by adding furniture to his newsletter in the year 1948, the immediate success of the new line led him to give up the smaller items that he had in his newsletter. In the year 1951, to reduce the product returns, he opened a display store in the nearby village to allow customers to inspect products before buying. It was an immediate success, with customers traveling seven hours from the capital Stockholm by train to visit the store. Based on this store's success, IKEA stopped accepting mail orders. As Campred developed and refined his furniture retailing business model, also, he became increasingly frustrated with the way a tightly knit cartel of furniture manufacturer who controlled the Swedish industry to keep the prices of furniture high. He began to view the situation not just as a business opportunity, but also as an unacceptable social problem which he wanted to correct. The small newsletter soon expanded into a full catalog. This 1953 issue introduced what would become another key IKEA feature, which was self-assembled furniture. Instead of buying complete pieces of furniture, customers bought them in a flat packages and put them together themselves at home. This knockdown concept was fully systemized, saving transport and storage cost. In typical fashion, Camper turned the savings into still lower prices for his customers, gaining even larger following among young householders who are looking for well-designed but inexpensive furnitures. Between the year 1953 and the 1955, the company's sales doubled from 3 million to 6 million. By the mid-1990s, IKEA was the world's largest specialized furniture retailer. Sales of the IKEA Group for the financial year ending August 1994 was about $4.5 billion. In the previous year, more than 116 million people had visited 98 IKEA stores in 17 countries. Most of them are drawn there by company's product catalog, which was printed yearly in 72 million copies in 34 languages. The privately held company did not report the profit levels, but one estimate put its net margin at 8.4% in 1994, yielding a net profit of about $375 million. After a decades of seeking new sources, in the mid-1990s, IKEA worked with almost 2,300 suppliers in 70 countries, sourcing a range of around 11,200 products. Its relationship with its supplier 
was dominated by commercial issues and its 24 trading services offices in 19 countries primarily monitored production, tested new product ideas, negotiated prices, and checked quality. In the early 1980s, Danish authorities passed regulations to define limits for formaldehyde emissions permissible in building products. The chemical compound was used as a binding glue in materials such as plywood and particle board and often seeped out as a gas. At concentrations above 0.1 mg per kg in air, it could cause watery eyes, headaches, a burning sensation in the throat and difficulty in breathing. With IKEA's profile as a leading local furniture retailer using particle board in many of its products, it became a prime target for regulators wanting to publicize the new standards. So when tests showed that some IKEA products emitted more formaldehyde than was allowed by legislation, the case was widely publicized and the company was fined. More significantly, and the re real lesson for IKEA was that due to publicity, its sales dropped 20% in Denmark. In response to this situation, the company quickly established stringent requirements regarding formaldehyde emission, but soon found that suppliers were failing to meet its standards. The problem was that most of its supplier bought from sub-suppliers, who in turn bought the binding material from glue manufacturers. Eventually, IKEA decided it would have to work directly with the glue producing chemical companies and with the collaboration of companies such as ICI and BASF, soon found ways to reduce the formaldehyde of gassing in its product. These events prompted IKEA to address broader environmental concerns more directly. Since wood was the principal material in about half of the IKEA products, forestry became a natural starting point. Following discussions with both Greenpeace and World Wide Fund for Nature and using standards set by the Forest Stewardship Council, IKEA established a forestry policy stating that IKEA would not accept any timber, veneer, plywood or layer glued wood from intact natural forest or from forests which have a high conservation value. This meant that IKEA had to be willing to take on the task of tracing all woods used in IKEA products back to its source. To monitor compliance, the company appointed forest managers to carry out random checks of wood suppliers and run projects on responsible forestry around the world. In addition to forestry, IKEA identified four other areas where environmental criteria were to be applied to its business operations. Adapting the product range, working with suppliers, transport and distribution, and ensuring environmentally conscious stores. In the year 1994, as IKEA was still working to resolve the formaldehyde problems, a Swedish television documentary showed children in Pakistan working at weaving looms. Among the several Swedish companies mentioned in the film as importers of carpets from Pakistan, IKEA was the only high profile name on the list. Just two months into her job as a business area manager for carpets, Ms. Mary Ann Barner recalled the shockwaves that the TV program sent through the company. As a part of its response, IKEA sent a legal team to Geneva to seek input and advice from the International Labour Organization on how to deal with the problem. Following this discussion with the ILO, IKEA added a clause to all supplier contracts, a black and white clause, as Barner put it, stating simply that if the supplier employed children under legal working age, the contract would be cancelled. To take the load off field trading managers and to provide some independence to the monitoring process, the company appointed a third party agent to monitor child labor practices at its supplier place in India and Pakistan.
After managing the initial response to the crisis, Barner and her direct manager traveled to India, Nepal, and Pakistan to learn more. On the trip, Barner also learned of the formation of the Rugmark Foundation, a recently initiated industry response to the child labor problem in the Indian carpet industry. It was to develop a label certifying that the hand knotted carpets to which it was attached were made without the use of child labor. To implement this idea, the Rugmark Foundation was organized to supervise the use of the label. As a major purchaser of Indian rugs, IKEA was invited to sign up with Rugmark as a way of dealing with the ongoing potential for child labor problems on products sourced from India. The more Barner learned, the more complex the situation became. As a business area manager with full profit and loss responsibility for carpets, she knew she had to protect not only her business but also the IKEA's brand image. Yet she viewed her responsibility as broader than it is. She felt the company should do something that would make a difference in the lives of the children she had seen. It was a view that was not universally held within IKEA where many were concerned that every proactive stand could put the business at a significant cost disadvantage to its competitors. Then in the spring of 1995, a year after IKEA began to address this issue, a well-known German documentary maker notified the company that a film he had made was about to broadcast on German television showing children working at looms at Rangan Exports, one of the IKEA's major suppliers. While refusing to let the company preview the video, the filmmaker produced still shots taken directly from the video. The producer then invited IKEA to send someone to take part in a live discussion during the airing of the program. For Barner, the first question was whether to recommend that IKEA participate in the program or decline the invitation. Beyond the immediate public relation issue, she also had to decide how to deal with Rangan Exports, apparent violation of the contractual commitment it had made not to use child labor. And finally, she made the decision of cutting off one of the company's major suppliers of Indian rugs. While such a move would disrupt supply and affect sales, she found the reasons to do so quite compelling. Thank you everyone for watching this video. See you soon with another interesting case study. For more such case studies, please subscribe 5 Minutes Learning Channel in YouTube.